Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the American Philosophical Society. Uh, my name is Patrick Spiro, and I'm the librarian of the Society, and I'm Zooming uh, to all of you from Library Hall. Uh, while we're currently closed to the public, uh, I hope that you all will find a way to visit us in the future. And for those of you unfamiliar with the library or the Society, I want to tell you a little bit about uh, what we have here. Um, the Society's library holds over 14 million pages of manuscripts. We have over 300,000 bound volumes and a small but impressive artifact collection. Um, we are, our holdings include the papers of Benjamin Franklin. We have one of the largest collections of endangered uh, languages in the world. And we have the papers of pathbreaking scientists, including uh, the papers of seven Nobel laureates. But we also have a museum that showcases these treasures. Uh, every year we open a new exhibition. And next year, we hope uh, if uh, things uh, continue to improve with the pandemic, our next ex exhibition will open in April uh, entitled Dr. Franklin, Citizen Scientist. And it will uh, explore the, the world of science in the age of Franklin. And the one following that exhibition is on the history of climate science. Uh, so I hope you all will find a way to visit us in person, uh, but if you can't, to also visit us online to see all that the society offers. Uh, mm -hmm. We have a publications program. Uh, we have a number of events. Many of them are now hosted virtually. And we have a very robust research program, giving out over a million dollars of research and fellowships a year to scholars that need to conduct research anywhere in the world. So please visit our website, www.amphilsoc.org. And I think we'll post that website uh, in the chat box as well so that everybody can see it. It's not easy sometimes to type in what, what we say. That's a weird website. Uh, so uh, today, uh, uh, again, I'm thrilled to welcome everybody virtually um, to Library Hall uh, to unveil our most recent uh, digital project entitled Investigating Indentured Servitude. Uh, and I want to take a few moments before turning things over to the uh, people who have built this project to tell you a little bit about the Center for Digital Scholarship here. Uh, it's the center that built this project, incubated it, developed it, and has now published it. And then I want to turn things over to Bayard Miller, the head of the center, who will talk a little bit more about it. Uh, the Center for Digital Scholarship was founded in 2017, and it was our answer to a question that we were grappling with as an independent research library that was home to a very unique collection that we wanted more people to be aware of and to have access to. Uh, like so many other special collections libraries, we are uh, and will continue to be committed to digitizing our materials so that more people can have access to the original sources, uh, original sor sources in digital surrogate format, of course, anywhere in the world, 24 hours a day, uh, seven days a week. But we also wonder what is the next step after digitization? What comes next for a library like ours? And we realized that we had an opportunity to do more with what we digitized. So we created a center that was meant to explore um, what the future of digital might look like in an independent research library. And so as you can see here on the slide, the center was formed uh, and its mission was to digitize, to incubate new discovery tools and to create innovative digital humanities projects. And I briefly want to tell you about some of the other things that we've done before turning over to our most recent uh, project. Uh, first, you'll see on this slide something that we call PAL, or People Also Liked, which was our first project. And its objective was to create an online uh, reference tool. Uh, the idea was to use past researchers' data to help guide prospective future researchers to discover new collections, collections they may not have originally realized might be related to their project. It works a lot like Amazon's People Also Bought or People Also Liked. Um, and it's now an open source uh, project that other libraries can use to integrate into their systems. And so if you're interested, I encourage you all to reach out to us to learn more. Uh, we then began to develop um, uh, digital projects, the first of which was what we call Eastern State Apps. And in this project, we took all of our records, uh, intake records for Eastern State Penitentiary, which was a uh, early uh, uh, penitentiary in Philadelphia, founded in the early 19th century. We had a, rec had a record of every inmate that was admitted to the prison, along with a lot of their biographical background uh, that was taken when they first entered the prison. We thought this was an incredible uh, source that could do, tell us so much about early American history, about the social life of Philadelphia, and also about the history of incarceration. And so we digitized this material, but then we created data sets out of all of it. 
And we created an uh, a, a innovative uh, website that allows for interaction, an interactive website where you can play with and manipulate this data at, to ask questions about the history of incarceration in Pennsylvania in the 19th century. And so I encourage you all to check out this website. Um, our next project uh, we call the Benjamin Franklin Postal Project. And in this uh, uh, project, we, we hold all of the postal records uh, of uh, uh, Franklin's Philadelphia Post Office. We have records of every piece of mail that arrived in Philadelphia, when it arrived, and who the recipient was. And we, again, thought this was an incredible data set, that digitizing it was one thing, but then translating that raw digital material into data sets that can be manipulated by scholars could tell us so much about early American history, about the history of Philadelphia, and also about early American communication networks. And so we released that project uh, earlier this year, and I encourage you all to check it out. We discovered new things about Philadelphia. We discovered new things about the way the Postal Service worked, uh, and it's a great project, and uh, I encourage you all to, to check it out. And all of these projects uh, had at their core, um, we wanted to show people not only what you could do with uh, the data, but to encourage people to ask their own questions of this material, to have access to the raw data, to ask questions of it themselves, and hopefully to begin a conversation that continues in classrooms, in dining rooms, in uh, uh, research halls throughout uh, uh, the United States and indeed the world. And so investigating in, in venture is our most recent initiative. Um, it's been over a year in the works and is the product of a lot of people's time and effort, especially those in the Center uh, for Digital Scholarship who you'll hear from uh, momentarily, but also outside scholars and researchers who help guide the project and help inspire us uh, to think about what we could do with this data. And so I want to thank all of them for the work that they put into this project. And I hope you'll be as impressed with this project as I am. And so with that, I'll turn it over to Bayard, uh, who's going to talk a lot more about what this project uh, has done and what the center has done with open data. Great. Uh, thanks, Pat. Uh, and hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Bayard Miller. And as Pat said, I run the Center for Digital Scholarship here at the APS. Uh, before I start, I should just go on record and say this is my first uh, Zoom presenting event, so I don't really know where I'm looking at any time, so just sort of bear with me with that. Um, but I really am thrilled to be here today to introduce this project, which uh, we've been working on for actually uh, nearly three years. And you'll hear more about that in a little bit. Um, but before I do that, uh, I want to briefly introduce you to, you know, uh, what open data at the APS is. Uh, so next slide. Uh, so over the past several years, we've really focused a lot of attention on what we call our open data initiative. And we've been creating uh, structured data sets using our library's collections. Under this initiative, we, uh, one, identify content in the APS library that's conducive to being reconfigured as data. And two, we encourage the use and reuse of the data by opening up to all and facilitating access uh, to them. Uh, so what does this really actually mean? Uh, next slide. Uh, we like to think of our open data initiative as sort of moving beyond digitization. Our primary focus at the CDS is to provide innovative access to APS collections. And of course, digitization is one of the main ways that we do that. Uh, but we believe that creating data sets from digital objects takes it just that one step further uh, and sort of enhances access to collection materials by providing patrons with not only scanned images of a page, but also the data contained on that page and also in a format that's a lot easier to manipulate that can be put to various uses as seen here with the uh, uh, Eastern State data. Um, next slide. Great. Uh, so, uh, so far we've created uh, and released uh, 15 open data sets uh, and we've launched two digital projects which Patrick just highlighted before. Uh, and these projects uh, offer several ways to interact with the data. Uh, the, uh, the Eastern apps, uh, as you see on the left, uh, this was our first foray, as Patrick mentioned before, into the world of open data. And, and with this, we created a suite of interactive applications that allow users to analyze that data from the emission books uh, taken uh, from Philadelphia's Eastern State Penitentiary from 1839 to 1850. And again, uh, our, our most recently released project is the Philadelphia Post Office Ledger Project. Uh, this project really analyzes the data created from a, a very long overlooked account book kept by Benjamin Franklin during his career as postmaster. Uh, and it certainly is a relevant project today as we 
sort of think about the, the post office and uh, the important role that it plays to democracy in America. Uh, next slide. Uh, so uh, we always have at least one open data project in the works and then some just sort of in the hopper. We currently have two open data projects in the works now. Uh, the first one is a, it, it focuses on historic meteorological records held at the APS. Uh, I've highlighted uh, at least 15 journals or diaries uh, kept by uh, various folks in our collections that we're going to use for this project. But we started uh, with, uh, as you see on the, the left hand side, um, James Madison's records kept at his plantation uh, right here. Uh, this project's going to be part of a, a much larger collaboration with uh, uh, the folks from the uh, Thomas Jefferson Papers at Princeton University and also the Center for Digital Editing uh, at the University of Virginia. And of course, since we can't get enough of our founder, Ben Franklin, uh, we've been working with our long-term DH fellow, Bethany Farrell, uh, to analyze data found within the account books he and, and Deborah kept at the shop right around the corner here in Philadelphia. And you see this is the uh, shop book uh, kept, uh, we think, in Deb's hand uh, on the right here. This project, uh, I'm pretty excited about it. It's definitely going to add to and it, certainly complement the work that we've already done uh, on the postal uh, project. Uh, but our open data projects, I really think they're great because there's so much that can be done with these data sets. Uh, our main objective at the CDS is to get it out there, show people what they can do with it. Uh, I really do encourage uh, you all to, to check these projects out learn more and, and use the data. Uh, I, I honestly mean that we really want you to use this data. Uh, and sort of more importantly, if you do use the data, uh, let us know what you do with it. We're always curious. You know, we put out the data sets, we get them out there, uh, and we're just really interested to see what people actually do with it. Um, and, and also, I should mention, if you have ideas for projects, uh, we'd love to hear from you. Collaboration is a huge part of the work we do with the CDS, especially with the Open Data Initiative. Because uh, as you know, or you'll find out uh, coming up, creating open data is very time consuming work. And because my department consists of two individuals, we really couldn't do it without the collaboration. This comes in many forms, as you can see here on this slide. Uh, but uh, the open data projects, uh, I think up to this point, have been the result uh, of our digital humanities fellowships. Um, we offer two competitive fellowships per year. Uh, so if you like what you see today and you think, hey, that sounds like a cool opportunity, I, I do encourage you to apply when we uh, reopen the call for applications uh, sometime uh, next year. Uh, we welcome scholars working on independent digital projects and of course scholars who want to collaborate with us. Uh, next slide. Uh, this leads me to investigating indentured servitude. Uh, uh, yeah, that's right. Uh, this project grew out of a, a, what I think is a particularly successful collaboration and I think it's become sort of one of my uh, favorite projects that I've worked on here uh, as the head of uh, uh, digital scholarship uh, because of the collaborative spirit and the nature of the project. When we put out a call for applicants for the DH Fellow in 2018, uh, we offered the Indenture Project just as an example of something that someone could potentially come to work on. Uh, little did we know or think that someone would uh, take us up on it, uh, but I'm really excited uh, that she did because I'm excited how this project turned out. Uh, Nicole Meehan joined us for a month of, of pretty intense collaboration in June of 2019 uh, and has been working with us uh, remotely from Scotland ever since. Uh, and as my colleagues will detail uh, after this, uh, this was a long, but I do think ultimately rewarding process. Um, so it's now my pleasure to introduce you to the Indenture Project team. Uh, so first we're gonna hear from uh, Cynthia Hyder. Cynthia is the Digital Project Specialist uh, at the Center for Digital Scholarship. Uh, where she works to increase the digital accessibility and preservation of the APS's collections and to promote their use. Uh, her work uh, has been particularly informed by her interest in the structure, integrity, and ethics of data use in the humanities. Uh, you know, she's worked on various digitization and open data projects at APS since joining our team in 2017 uh, as the Martin L. Levitt Fellow. Um, she also holds an MA in History from Temple University Center for Public History, as well as a BA in History from Goucher College. So using this indenture project uh, as an example, she's going to walk us through the process of creating an open data project at the APS. Uh, Nicole Meehan uh, is a lecturer in museum and gallery studies uh, and a doctoral researcher at the University of St. Andrews. Uh, she's previously worked uh, at the Hunterian Museum and Art Gallery, uh, National Gallery of Scotland and Historic Environment in Scotland, uh, and a range of digital and audience engagement roles. Her current research examines the systems of value that determine how the digital museum object is perceived 
and used in cultural context. Uh, through examining networked interactions around digital museum objects, Nicole assesses their impact upon memory creation. Uh, today, Nicole is going to discuss uh, you know, how this collaboration and how the Indenture Project uh, relates to her own research. Uh, with that, I, I welcome they both uh, welcome both of them as they take us on their journey of discovery. Uh, take it away, Cynthia. Hello there. <laughs> Uh, I trust you can hear me now. I'm Cynthia Heider, Digital Project Specialist at the APS, as Bayard has just talked about. Um, and so I am going to begin this data journey uh, for you. We're going to go all the way back to summer 2017. If I could have the next slide, please. Next slide, please. Cynthia, just go ahead. We're having okay. a little bit of technical trouble here. Got it. Uh, yeah, that is uh, a given. Any live technological demonstration will definitely go wrong. But uh, so anyway, I'm going to take you back in your mind for now uh, to the summer of 2017 when this project began as actually the second open data, data initiative uh, project through the CDS. Uh, ben Weinstein, who was uh, an undergraduate at Washington College of Maryland, came to the APS as an Explore America intern, and he worked with the then head of technology, uh, S.L. Ziegler, to digitize the book uh, and begin setting the stage to turning this uh, massive volume uh, into a data set. Um, so as Bayard has just talked about, the APS has tons and tons of items in our collections that are amenable to possible computational analysis uses, um, digital humanities, uh, pathbreaking methods and all of that. Um, but first, before you do anything with those items, they have to be structured in a way that a computer can understand. Um, so this particular volume, oh, perfect, as you can see on the left, um, was chosen because it was uh, it had a semi-structured format already, as you can kind of see in the middle there. Uh, so this lists out names of uh, uh, people coming to the port of Philadelphia between 1771 and 1773. It lists the, the details of their contracts of either indenture or apprenticeship that were uh, that they entered into upon uh, landing here in the port. Um, so this is a great example of semi-structured data. This is also a really valuable genealogical resource, which we knew already because the German Society of Pennsylvania had produced a tabulated version of the book, which you can see there on the right, uh, the, the title page, uh, in 1907. Um, so this was a, a regularly cited source in genealogical circles and in histories of the redemptioner system of indenture, which uh, generally happened among Germans who would board a ship to British North America free of charge with the understanding that once they landed uh, at port, the captain would have the opportunity to recoup those costs by auctioning off their labor contracts. So we had, all of these uh, great um, resources. Ben uh, did a great job researching the book. He finished his digitization and he began the process of transcribing its context into structured data. And one thing I do wanna point out uh, is that this image really, really does not convey uh, the massive size of this volume. It's probably a good five inches thick, it's huge. Uh, and this was a really big undertaking to digitize and transcribe all of this work, which is part of the reason why it took uh, you know, a little over two years to actually finish the work of this. Um, so after his departure, uh, I took the process over. Next slide, please. Um, and so going upon uh, the work that I had previously done with the Franklin Postal uh, Ledgers project and thinking more and more about open data uh, and with the goal in mind of being able to produce visualizations and analyses of the data, uh, which you can see there at the bottom, the ones that we were eventually able to do, um, I began the process of breaking down the book's entries into their component parts. So the contents of the page on the left had to become the spreadsheet on the right. So that you can see maybe some separate fields for date, first and last name, departure and arrival location, contract terms, type of contract, and lots and lots and lots more. Um, this process of categorization allows a computer to sort and calculate those fields. Um, which we hoped would draw out broader observations about the practices of indentured servitude and, and apprenticeship as practiced in the Port of Philadelphia 
from 1771 to 1773. But the downside is that we had to make a lot of choices in order to essentially squeeze the nuance inherent that are in, inherent in these original entries so that they can fit into this nice structured uh, spreadsheet and play nice with computational analysis tools. And so this sometimes would take the form of standardizing place names, things like that. Um, and just so that we could have a marker there so that people could trace back uh, our own scholarship, uh, the process of making this data set and for our own use as well, we would always uh, made sure to provide a breadcrumb trail back to the original by noting carefully for each of the entries, uh, the page it was sourced from, and we provide a URL to the scan page in question. And that's uh, present in the data set itself as you can download it now. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. So with this process, as I mentioned, come a lot of complexities. Uh, I want to forefront that this and all data is constructed. It's really important to be upfront about that. Uh, the data set that we provide here is not objective or neutral, um, and it never was to begin with. So the book itself, the information inside of it was gathered by a specific person at, standing at the Port of Philadelphia in a specific position of power, uh, creating this, this record of labor contracts for very specific purposes. And it, the entire thing is situated from their perspective. You cannot separate that out. Um, but not only that, it only captures uh, each entry just captures one snapshot of one point in a life uh, that is, you know, probably under duress. And, you know, I think we can all agree that you probably cannot quantify uh, anyone's life by one moment alone. Um, so uh, that's part of the problem of the just the complexity, the ambiguity, the nuance that's inherent in the data itself. Uh, we also had to deal with the fact that uh, the book that we have in our collection now was loaned out a couple times in the late 1800s and came back missing 10 pages, uh, which is a problem. Um, but uh, luckily, because we had this German Society of Pennsylvania transcription from 1907, uh, we were able to look at that to try and figure out what the missing pages, what was in, in the missing pages, um, 10 of which, yeah, we were able to find from here. But the other problem of that is that this tabulation is not actually accurate. So the German Society of Pennsylvania, again, this data is constructed for a specific purpose. Uh, people going through to usually perform genealogical research. So there were things that they left out. Um, so that's unfortunately, we don't have that uh, for those 10 pages in our particular data set. Uh, the other um, issue here was that if we wanted to do analysis, we had to impose categories on it. So one example of this is uh, gender, uh, which is a useful category for analysis. Uh, and Nicole uh, worked on this a little bit later on when she came onto the project, but we had to impose gender categories for analysis onto uh, documents that didn't have that as an inherent part of, of their original information. So you know, by using pronouns and looking at names, this is not an exact process and you know, it's, it's problematic in a lot of ways, but uh, you know, we have to be able to <laughs> analyze it somehow and sometimes you have to flatten. Uh, the data to be able to do that. Um, so the next slide, please. So yeah, so to flatten things, uh, we need to bring our humanist priorities to that process. Um, we are all trained historians, although we are not <laughs> early Americanists. Um, and so we need to recognize when digitization and datafication create a distance from what is a real, tangible, complex person, thing, or process uh, that it describes itself. And Nicole will talk more about this in her presentation as well. So how do you kind of get around these limitations? And to us, that meant um, a process of being really transparent about our method, um, telling people, you know, documenting exactly how we change things. Um, so, you know, providing that breadcrumb trail so that people can check our scholarship later. Um, we thought it was quite important to uh, attribute labor, as Bayer talked about a little bit. This is a really arduous product process. It involves a lot of people and a lot of work, some of which is pretty thankless and boring, um, but nevertheless vital to the success of the final product. So the attribution of that, um, really being just keeping aware that these, you know, each entry is, is a person. This is a real person who lived a real life, and this is not just a data point. So that when you go through and analyze, you need to be cognizant of that and respect their humanity as a humanist, um, 
And to the point as well, because we're not early Americanists, we're not subject specialists in this particular period of time or in labor history, we look to others for, um, for guidance. So we consulted with subject area experts, including Dr. Billy Smith. Um, we did user testing, just really trying to understand what the nuances and understanding that we may have made mistakes uh, and trying to rectify those. We also drew on the scholarship. Uh, I'm personally quite uh, fond of the scholarship of Jacqueline Wernemont, Elizabeth Losh, Sophia Noble, Catherine D'Ignazio, Lauren Klein, and Jessica Marie Johnson in talking about data and the way that uh, you know interpreting it and flattening it can actually uh, impact real human beings in the real world. Um, so next slide, please. So, so we really, uh, it has been uh, said before, we really urge you to explore this data for yourself. This is why we do these open data initiatives. Um, we, we really encourage people who are subject specialists who may have more to add, um, who can explore and have more time on their hands to do these things, uh, to really dig in there and do them. Um, so it's available for download um, from our website or the digital library, as well as a repository. And this is also published in uh, UPenn's magazine of early American data sets, which is also a great resource if you're looking for uh, contemporary data sets for uh, this kind of thing. Uh, so you do have to download the data set itself if you want to play around with it, because at this point we don't have a way to make uh, it full text searchable within our digital library. But uh, once you do that, you can uh, you know, undertake the process of comparing it with other contemporary primary sources and data sets. You can visualize it. We use Tableau uh, on our website, but there's also there's other tools like Palladio, Flourish, and Data Wrapper that work quite well. Um, and you can use this in the you can use this as a genealogist, you can use this as an individual, but it's also ideal for the classroom. So the component of data ethics and, da and critical data literacy. Uh, is one that's pretty a big issue in the DH classroom uh, in recent times. There's also an opportunity for critical primary source analysis, uh, genealogical research, um, and just looking at social history and generally pulling out stories um, that might not necessarily be documented uh, in other places. So with that, um, we really, really hope that you'll use the, the data and let us know uh, what you come up with. Um, but I will hand it off to Nicole now, who uh, is going to talk a little bit more about her interest in the way that people actually do interact with sources like this and what that means. Thanks. Hi there, uh, I'm Nicole Mahan. I'm a lecturer and doctoral researcher at the University of St Andrews in Scotland. So you'll see that I'm currently in Scotland, which is why it's dark outside is at 6pm here. Um, I'm absolutely delighted to be here with you today to discuss this project. It's been one of the most enjoyable collaborative projects that I've been involved in and one that I think has achieved a great result. Um, and I hope that you'll agree with me once uh, you explore the exhibition. Um, so today I want to talk about the project, its impact on my scholarship and how it's informed my wider research. I do also want to start by saying that I am also not an early Americanist um, and I have to admit that this exhibition is my first foray into the subject matter and indeed my own journey of discovery. Therefore, as a Digital Humanities Fellow, I really approached the exhibition um, from a beginner's perspective, but I think in some ways this is a really productive um, and helpful starting point. So in my own research, I think widely about the digital museum object um, and its impact of the increasing presence of it on wider forms of group remembering. Strangely, these objects are created every day by cultural institutions, um, but they do not yet have an agreed upon definition. For the purposes, therefore, of uh, this talk and my research project, I have opted to define the digital museum object as one that's purposefully created by a museum or cultural institution as a true and faithful digitized image of a physical museum object in 2D or 3D or a born digital object. And you can see on this slide um, that that can encompass a wide range of objects. This is just a, a few screenshots of um, images in the British Museum's online collection database. 
Really importantly, though, I'd like to say that I don't view or I'd like to trouble um, the thought that the digital museum object is simply a replica, a copy or a surrogate. I think it has much more to offer us and by divorcing it from that sort of hierarchical relationship with the physical, we can, uh, we can interrogate that. So I was really delighted to be involved in curating this exhibition at the American Philosophical Society built from and with digital museum objects. I was absolutely thrilled when my application was accepted and I would really encourage anyone who's thinking about applying to, to get an application in there because it's, it's a fabulous experience. So the digital objects that are used in the exhibition um, range from the data set created from the indenture records of which a huge amount uh, of work went into as Cynthia's outlined, the visualizations we created from this data set that I'll describe in a second, and the accompanying digitized images that we used to contextualize these. And being involved in this process really influenced and impacted my scholarship in two main ways. The first has been described by Cynthia um, in that it really shaped my approach to data ethics. Um, in conversations with Cynthia and Bayard in the in the centre, I was really um, it it became really evident um, how we were treating this data and our own biases um, and decisions that we we're making about it were really affecting how it is presented to the public. And then the second way was in deepening my understanding of how these digital museum objects are produced mediated and recruited into sort of circulating networks of many other objects. So to summarize in my research, I make the argument that the digital museum object is often thought of as lesser than its physical counterpart. And to kind of look at this a little bit more, I conducted a series of interviews with museum professionals in 2018 and there were a number of uh, things that came out of these interviews that both uh, agreed and disagreed with this view. If I can move to the next slide, please. One of the interviewees uh, stated that you can still use your senses to understand it, the digital museum object, but you can't use all the same senses as with the physical object. And this highlights the fact that the digital is most often defined in relation to the physical. And it highlights these areas where there is a perceived comparative deficit. Perhaps the digital is intangible and therefore seen as lacking in materiality or aura. But others contradicted this, if we can move to the next slide, please. Um, saying there's a tangible thing there that you can see, you can hear and you can relate to. So there are some senses that we use in our discovery of the digital museum object. And we say it's material in some way because we use our bodies and senses to understand it as we do with the physical object. Some even brought attention to what the digital can do that the physical cannot, if we move to the next slide. Saying, I think that value comes down to how it helps people engage with the object more. So digital objects are interacted with differently in differing scales, differing angles and manipulations and in different context, contexts. So we may therefore engage even more deeply with them without perhaps realizing. Creating the exhibition from the record of indentures, this incredibly rich volume meant an opportunity to explore different qualities of digital museum objects and to consider why people might value them in different ways. And quite immediately at the start of my fellowship, I was struck by the physicality of the digital. Um, by this, I mean that all digital objects are material in some way, um, we're situated in the physical world when we interact with them. And I began my fellowship sitting in the library, the beautiful library of the American Philosophical Society, simultaneously viewing the digitized indenture records on my laptop whilst delicately turning the pages of this beautiful and weighty volume. And whilst I was doing that, I was contemplating how best to craft a digital portal to both of these types of objects. How can we make it a satisfying digital interactive experience? And how could the scale of information held within the pages within, I mean, 5,000 records be communicated meaningfully to those who would visit the exhibition? If I can move to the next slide, please. As Cynthia has described, the data within the records of indentures has been painstakingly transcribed into a spreadsheet. And that proved to be the bedrock of the exhibition and the visualizations that the exhibition is built around. 
Visualising the data allows us to show, hopefully in a manageable way, the totality of the indenture contracts entered into in Philadelphia at this time. And very meaningfully and valuably, it helps us to analyse the data using different lenses. And in this case, we chose only three of, of many lenses, um, which were gender, time and geography. And you can explore these when you visit the exhibition itself. If we could move to the next slide, please. So the physical book is transformed into a digital object, um, the visualizations, but these alone uh, didn't seem to be enough, nor did they satisfy our curiosity. For as soon as we began to examine the graphs and charts and maps that we created, we began to take note of the people within, those represented in the dots or lines, those that comp comprise the normal um, or the norm, and then those that are radically different. And we found delving into these stories really irresistible. And we hope this would be the case for everyone who visited the exhibition. So therefore in each theme within the exhibition, we selected one individual and we tried to find out more about them, which in turn led to us making connections with more digital museum objects. And we'll see here, um, this is the length of indenture visualization that we created and highlighted um, on the right hand side within the red box is someone who sits outside the norm. Um, so the, the normal kind of length of contract was four years, but we see that there's someone who's actually indentured for 26 years. And that brings us on to the story of Catherine Beesman. If we can move to the next slide, please. So this is her um, entry in the indenture records, which incidentally is another digital museum object. And we know that on August the 1st, 1772, Catherine Beesman was indentured as a servant to James Smith. And in fact, we found out that this contract was a continuation of an initial agreement signed in September the 17th, 1771 with George Michael Kraft. The visualization um, shows that this was really an unusually long period of time and investigating further showed us um, that there was a mention of Catherine in another data set um, where we learned that she had previously resided in the Philadelphia Alms House. And the record in that data set describes Catherine as a mulatto, which is a term used in the 18th century for a person of mixed race and one that really illuminates the inherently racialized structure of society. We see later that Catherine's contract was transferred back to George Michael Kraft and that she moved to the Northern Liberties area of Philadelphia to learn housewifery, to read in the Bible, to write a legible hand and to sew plain work. Unfortunately, we cannot find any more information about Catherine, but we can read about this small part in her, of her life. And this really helps to personalize the data set and allows us to appreciate just a fraction of the emotion that is really contained within its pages. We can understand that, therefore, that visualizations remove us from the reality of lived experience of the individuals that are represented. So in the exhibition currently, we've pieced together from various sources snapshots of the lives of three different people within these records, but there remain over 5,000 more. And we would invite you to see uh, what you can find out about them. And, and as Byrd said, come back to us um, and tell us what you can find. Just returning to uh, my research, if we can move to the next slide, please. We wanted to craft a visual narrative around Catherine's entry to um, really highlight uh, more of what her life might have been like during this small period of time. And therefore we use some more digital museum objects. Uh, for example, this is a 1799 lithograph which shows the Spruce Street Alms House in Philadelphia where Catherine was originally indentured. So we know um, at some of, about the conditions in which she lived. And this is held in the print collections um, of the APS. If we can move to the next slide, please. And we also used um, and created new digital museum objects uh, to explain some about the practice of indenture. So this is a, an originally um, created contract uh, of Eleanor White's indenture. And we can see um, that it's signed by, with an X by Eleanor who 
uh, was unable to sign her own name. We use this in the what is indentured servitude section to show an example of what these contracts looks like. So it's a very kind of visceral uh, experience to look at something like this. And in other areas, we use digitized objects from the collections of other institutions, uh, such as the Library of Con uh, Congress and the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And so that allowed us to link digital museum objects between disparate collections and create a much richer and more engaging exhibition. If we can move to the next slide, please. So what does the experience of creating this exhibition mean for my scholarship? Well, I can now easily map a network of digital museum objects and discern that this network is potentially without limit if we think about how many connections we can draw between uh, the records and other collections. Um, and if this data is made open to all, there may be uh, numerous and perhaps infinite connections to be made. Um, and what we can think about here is also that these uh, connections between objects and the way in which this exhibition might grow is that it's no longer solely under uh, the control of the creator or curator, but it can be uh, added to by people with many different types of expertise, perspectives and motivations. And we can see that the connectedness of these digital museum objects adds a new and different type of value to them when compared to the physical. And if we move to the next slide, this uh, quote taken from a survey of museum professionals that I conducted in 2019 really speaks to this situation where this respondent said that uh, the digital museum objects insertion into and circulation within a wider economy of cultural and commercial exchange has the capacity to break down the traditional aura of the museum object and cultural artifacts. So we could say that this elusive and potent aura of an object is not reserved only for the physical as we may have thought in the past, but there is an aura to the digital museum object. It's not absent, it's different. And if we conceive of the digital museum objects as having some sort of special aura, we can better appreciate the meaning and impact that it has upon us when we engage with it. And thinking in this way helps me to study digital museum objects in combination to consider their impact upon processes of wider memory formation. The networks of objects we created in this exhibition form a rich tapestry of diverse data, and we were able to put objects in conversation with one another cross institutionally and in varying mediums that would be far more difficult in a, in a physical uh, environment. And because online visitors are more in control of their journey through exhibitions, encountering objects, themes and information in differing permutations, the knowledge constructed and memories instituted might diverge from those intended by those who created the exhibition. And how does this activity impact cultural memory formation? Well, that's my ultimate research question and um, one that I would really like your help with. If we move to the next slides, please. One of the final pages of the, the online exhibition is a, a, a section entitled, What Do You Think? And I've included um, a small form here. And I would, if you're able to log on and um, answer some of the questions in this form, this would help my research um, to discern how people might interact with objects and how this might change how they view certain uh, periods in history. And this uh, will hopefully help in the future to produce very mindful and deeply thoughtful exhibitions that think about their impact in this wider historical narrative. So thank you for your time today and thank you to the APS um, for the fellowship, to Bayard and Cynthia for all of their time and the opportunity to learn an incredible amount from them. What I've learned uh, will shape my research and scholarship hugely for, for years to come. Please do go and experiment with the site, ask new questions of the data set, tell the stories of others within it and come back to us and let us know what you find. I, I'm sure we're very happy to answer questions if there are any. Hello. Yes, uh, there are a good amount of questions. Uh, thanks to both Nicole and Cynthia. That was great. Um, can we stop sharing the screen? Uh, or should we move it up? Oh, actually, there's one more slide, actually. Great. Contact us, reach out to us. This is all of our. Uh, our email addresses and uh, my colleagues' Twitter handles. Um, so we'll leave that up for the uh, duration of the questions. 
Uh, I would start by saying, uh, to reiterate, I think Cynthia mentioned this too, uh, thank you so much to our colleagues that we've collaborated with that you don't see here. Uh, uh, S.L. Ziegler, uh, my predecessor in the Center for Digital Scholarship, uh, really got the Open Data Initiative going and really started this project. First, and of course, Ben Weinstein, which we don't really know where Ben is, but we wish him well and, and uh, we really thank him for getting this started. And of course, to uh, Billy Smith, uh, who also asked questions here. Um, so Billy's comment is, Will, uh, he started saying, this is a fabulously rich project that can only be reduced by collaboration. Thank you. I thank you, Billy, uh, because we could have done it without you. But to your question, Billy, will you allow scholars to post their own ideas and findings online? If so, will you have a review process to make decisions about what is allowed? Um, I don't have an exact answer to that. Uh, that sounds great, and we would have a review process for that, but, but we really are, uh, like we said, we're, we're open to collaboration. I want scholars to use this data and to contact us to be like, hey, I found this, I built this great visualization, what do you think? Uh, I mean, this, these open data projects, to me, uh, they're just meant to continue to grow, right? And just, just uh, move into something else. Like I mentioned with the Franklin Project earlier, that's moving into another phase, so it's so, the answer is yes. I don't know what that process would be yet, but contact us and reach out, um, anybody out there using this stuff. Uh, I'll just sort of work through these. So uh, I love this project. Thank you. Uh, uh, can you tell what the gender breakdown is in these records for equal numbers of women and men becoming indentured servants? Uh, I'll kick it to one of you uh, folks here. Um, I think we can say that it's not equal. Um, there are a number of visualizations under the gender section that show that there are far more um, male indenture contract signs, both apprentices and indentures and redemptioners. Um, but again, that is us uh, saying that a certain record is, um, I, we've identified that person as male judging by their name and then that might not be how they identified but um, within a margin of error we can be confident that there are definitely more male records um, than females um, and it's that's a really interesting section to look at if you consider um, the masters as well because there are obviously more male masters but there are actually um, some female masters and it's, it's really um, I think important to consider why that's the case um, and what it must have taken to be uh, a female master um, at that point. Oh, uh, I lost the question. Uh, so I understand that many of those who are indentured came from different German states. Are the manuscript records in English? Uh, sub question, did you standardize or anglicize the spelling of their names? So the records are in English because they were recorded upon arrival at the port of Philadelphia. And at that point, I, yes, I do speak German and looking at the names, I believe they have been anglicized by that person who created the data to begin with. Um, but other than that, there, there is no, we, we know the port that someone had left from, but not necessarily um, where, which German state or what specifically the barony or whatever that they came from. So that's a limitation in the, in the data itself. Um, sorry. Uh, uh, have you geo-referenced these records? Can we map where people came from and where they ended up? Good question. Um, I can take that one. Uh, so I went through a process before I actually arrived um, at the Center for Digital Scholarship um, to geo-reference as best as possible the records. Um, and I think we've outlined that some of the information about how that was conducted um, in the data transparency section. But there were, of course, limitations around that because um, obviously some of these areas don't exist anymore um, or they've been subsumed by other areas um, in terms of the councils around Philadelphia. Um, so it's not as incredibly precise uh, exercise that I conducted but there is uh, georeferencing available for uh, most of the records. Some of them don't actually have a location of departure um, uh, noted, um, and some of them don't definitely have a location in which the indenture contract would be served. And we also have to think about the fact that some of the contracts 
may have been transferred. So um, the person may have spent a limited amount of time at the a destination before moving somewhere else. Um, so there's there are limitations around that data, but it is uh, it should be available. And there's a great a few visualizations that do uh, use the georeferencing on the website. Check it out. Yeah, check it out. Um, all right, next question. So I see you could download a spreadsheet. Can I also see a scan of the original? Yes, uh, absolutely. With our all of our open data projects, you know, we learned early on like sort of what to do. So within the spreadsheet, you download the spreadsheet, you go to a record, you see, oh, I want to see this record, the actual page. Within each record is a link that takes you to the exact page, the exact record in our digital library. So yes, mm -hmm. uh, we are with our projects, we always want to you know send people back to the original document. So, you know, because because like Cynthia talked about, it's like, you know, we have biases that we put in these transcriptions and we make different, uh, you know, decisions for visualizations or whatnot. So it's always good to send people back to the original. Uh, this one comes from James Hill. Hello, James. Uh, were the length or terms of indenture different for German immigrants than for other immigrants? I don't know. I think that would be in there uh, in the data set. I think that. Uh, that's, that's work, uh, like I said before, we can't do everything, you know, uh, 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 while we'd like to, uh, but that's a good question uh, to explore in the data set, I'd say. If you guys have anything to add, please do. Uh, yeah, the, the, I mean, the German aspect of this is partly why it was, you know, for so long, a really great, rich, genealogical, popular thing. Um, and so there is some scholarship out there. Some of it is quite a bit older. Um, just looking, you know, more more intensely uh, across the the broader scheme of indenture and redemption, the redemption system in the uh, British North America. Uh, so that's a great source. I don't have anything off the top of my head I can refer you to, but there is a lot of stuff out there. Okay. Uh, this one comes from Tomiko. Uh, with the record of Catherine, would the name change if she was sold into would the name have changed if she was sold into slavery? Or is there a record of business conducting by the person she was serving? Uh. Ah, for the, the first question, I'm not sure. Um, I think that is a really interesting one to explore further. For the second, I tried uh, for quite a while to find more um, out about George Michael Craft. Um, and her uh, other the other person who held her indenture contract and I could get no further. Um, but if there are unmined data sets out there that contain this information, I would be uh, you know really excited to hear more about it because I think her story is incredibly important. It's quite an exemplar um, of the real issues um, in in this practice, but in in certain uh, as or sectors of the population who who were endangered um and if we can find out more about that i would be really interested to incorporate that into the exhibition great uh all right so uh from anna todd does the digital project and the material text that it relies on only pertain to immigrant indentures or were some of the individuals born in philadelphia does the project help guide the viewer to other non-digitized records within aps dealing with indentured services uh yes <laughs> Um, whoever wants to take that can take it. Um, I can say that I noticed that there were some Philadelphians uh, indentured. Uh, it was not only immigrants, although they made up by far the bulk um, of the indenture contracts. Um, but for example, um, Catherine Beesman was indentured from an almshouse in Philadelphia. Um, she, did, she did not uh, travel from elsewhere. She was born in Philadelphia. Um, and that seems to be a practice um, of taking um, younger people from almshouses. Um, so there are, there are a small section um, of people within the data set that were born in Philadelphia, but this, it is a small section. Uh, the second uh, question, might be better for one of you. I think that's a yes. I, I think in our references section, we reference things that are in our collections and, and it's something that we could update as we go. Um, but, but there's definitely other things in the APS collection that have to do with indentures. Uh, I should also, that just reminds me that I forgot to uh, uh, thank Val Lutz, our head of medicine processing. She was really, really helpful with this project. Uh, she's been really excited about the project. It helped us find all sorts of stuff in, in our collection and other collections. With regard to the first question, um, 
the subset of apprentices in the data set is actually a much uh, richer source of people who either were born in Philadelphia or currently lived in Philadelphia at the time that they were apprenticed. Um, so it's hard to, we don't have any arrival information for them. And so that, uh, that might be what you would like to look at. Yeah. Um... Cool. All right, we still got a little bit of time, so I'll ask a two-part question. Two people asked similar questions. So, uh, did you explore using OCR transcription tools to speed up the transcription process, such as transcribers, or was this done by hand? Um, this was done by hand, um, <laughs> completely. Uh, I, I don't, I don't know that. I'm not sure that transcribers would have worked in the way we would have wanted it to. Uh, for this type of data, um, because doing, and you said you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think doing it by hand with this, because it's already structured data and we're restructuring it in a way into a spreadsheet so that we can use it to manipulate it, I think a full transcription wouldn't have helped us very much. But I'm not sure. Yeah. That's something we'd like to explore going further. Uh, but we also, we also started this project in 2017, and HCR, yeah. the handwritten character recognition technology, has progressed so much in these past three years that. Um, I, I don't even think that there really was a good option for us at the time that we started this project. Yeah, um, the, the related question to that was from uh, Kevin Zip. Uh, can you say more about how the data set was created? Who did the work of converting from manuscript to digital form? Assuming multiple authors, how did you ensure continuity and quality? So uh, in terms of turning it into a digital object itself, the digitization was done by Ben Weinstein, the um, Explore America intern. Um, I, uh, he started the process of transcribing it into a spreadsheet and I uh, primarily took on the bulk of that uh, when, I, uh, when he, his internship ended and I came into the position. Um, and so uh, that was really me like using uh, spreadsheets and programs like OpenRefine to um, standardized, you know, we had already kind of gone through the process before we even started putting it into a spreadsheet of deciding what the categories would be, how, you know, you would handle particular issues or, you know, uh, ambiguities, things like that. And so uh, that's, that was primarily my work uh, was doing all of that sort of thing and wrapping it up so that it, you can use it uh, and download it. Okay, uh, I think we got time for like one more. Uh... Uh, there's so many good ones. Uh, and I should say, everybody, if you have these questions, you can follow up and we can follow up after and, and answer these questions for you. Um, so I'll ask this one from Cherry Huerta. Uh, did you get a sense of the purpose for keeping these indenture records? Was this part of tracking movement of peoples in the Philadelphia courts or part of the health question, potential for quarantining? Uh, who or what organization created the records and indentures and what was their authority? Um, Good question. This, these were official government records created uh, um, by the port portmaster. Um, yeah, primarily for keeping track of uh, valuable property uh, leases. Essentially, yeah, this is the reason that why that was created and maintained. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, on the, the front cover, it, it, yeah, it, the full title, which I don't know right off the top of my head, uh, lays it all out exactly what this is, but it's. it's the mayor of Philadelphia is the one that's authority uh, over this book. Um, uh, and I'll end on one more. Uh, and what happened after the indentures fulfilled their contract? Were they free citizens? Um, yeah. Uh, sometimes we don't know uh, a lot about what happened to these individuals. Uh, that's what we hope. We pulled out some of the stories that we could find. Uh, unfortunately, there's, there's not a lot of information. We've had a lot of folks this book. We hope that uh, you folks can dive into it. So, uh, start telling these stories, but but often you know um, they were given terms when they signed their contract, uh, where they would be uh, uh, be given uh, freedom dues, uh, and often that would come with sets of clothing, tools of the trade that they may have learned, and that much. There's a lot more information uh, on the site. I, I really uh, think you should definitely check that out. Um, but that's all the time we have for today. Uh, I really want to thank everybody for coming out. Um, we have a lot of big projects coming out, a related project coming up. We've got a, 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 a pretty big, a, a nice grant for a project called Revolutionary City, uh, where, uh, you know, we dive into materials like this, but materials at the APS that sort of tell the story of the revolution uh, from different angles. 
through the APS collections, HSP collections, uh, and LCP collections. And we're going to build a, a big digital portal to sort of pull all these materials together. So stay tuned for that as well. Um, but yeah, I, I'd like to thank my colleagues again. I'd like to thank the audience for coming out. And uh, yeah, that's great. Um, thanks. <laughs>